All right, I think we can get started. Um, uh, Brad Yunaka is going to be yep. speaking on uh, mill pillar coinage of Mexico City. Uh, for many of us who are American collectors, uh, we tend to think of coinage beginning in uh, 1792 with the birth of the U.S. Mint or perhaps some of the colonial state coinage, but there was in fact a lot of other things happening in uh, North America. And Brad's going to give us uh, some background on the uh, 18th century uh, milled pillar coinage of Mexico City. So uh, with with that, uh, Brad, you can uh, take it away. All right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm Brad Yonica, and before I start, I'd just like to thank the Numa Numismatic Portal for hosting this symposium. I'm going to talk today on the milled pillar coinage of Mexico City. Um, a lot on the history and a little bit on the varieties. Really, I'm going to start previous to the uh, striking of these coins and talk about a lot of the lead up uh, to, to their creation. I've been personally involved in this series for uh, over 12 years and I published three books uh, on Spanish colonial coinage. And today we're going to be talking about um, the subject of the, the first book I published 2017 which was on the fractional pillar coinage in Mexico City, but of course I'm also going to speak about the uh, the eight reals, the dollar size coins. Just so that everyone knows exactly what we're talking about, uh, here's a beautiful example of an eight real uh, struck in the first year that these coins were made in Mexico City Mint, and I wanted to show this coin just to give you a quick rundown on the design elements of the coin. Now I've shown this shield side on the obverse because that is technically the obverse on the coin. It has the name of the king, the issuing power. And since there is no portrait, that is the default side of the coin, you can call the obverse. And in the center, we have the Spanish coat of arms, which is very consistent through all the denominations, through all the years this coin was made, that was a consistent element. On the left, we have the assayer initial. And the assayer initial was important. Uh, because that was basically the signature of the issuing authority. This was the person, the initial of the name of the person who was responsible for making this coin intrinsically uh, with the in correct intrinsic silver value. And on the right hand side, we have the denomination, in this case, an eight, as in an eight reals. The legend reads Philip V, uh, Dia Gracia Hispanum et Indium Rex, translated as. Philip V, by the grace of God, king of the Spains and the Indies. On the reverse side of the coin, we have um, in the center, we have two globes. One globe has uh, a crude map of the new world, and the other globe has a crude map of the old world. And these are shown overlapping and overlain by a Spanish crown underlain by waves symbolizing the Atlantic Ocean and flanked by two pillars, which are the pillars, the mythical pillars of Hercules that uh, bracket the Straits of Gibraltar that connect the Mediterranean Sea with the Atlantic Ocean. And the little bit of propaganda uh, uh, that is being, um, as we translated by these symbols is that the Spanish were claiming that they were the ones who had united the old and the new world uh, under, their, under their royal house. And the legend across the top just confirms that, Utraki Unum, which means um, that the two may be one, as in the old and the new world. The pillars themselves are flanked by, in the case of the eight rails, are flanked by two uh, mint marks from Mexico City Mint, which during the majority of the time that the mint was in operation was an M with a smaller O above it. And then of course the date at the bottom. So the two geographic areas that, that are of the greatest importance for this coinage are, of course, on the left, we have New Spain, an old map, um, not really that accurate of what New Spain looked like in the early 1700s, the yellow part in the middle, which, um, which included all of modern day Mexico, along with a great deal of what is now Central America. 
Now this was one vice royalty of the, of the Spanish colonial system in the New World. New Spain was just the farthest north of several vice royalties that they had, which stretched through South America. And on the right, we have, of course, the old country, uh, and in, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. The three most important cities uh, with respect to the uh, pillar coinage are, of course, on, on the left, we have Mexico City. Now, the Mexico City Mint had been in operation for over 150 years at this point. And then on the right, we have the capital city of Spain. This is where the king lived and from whence came all the royal decrees and orders. And then the other important, most important city for us in the south would be Sevilla or Seville, which is the river port to which all of the silver was brought or all of the silver minus whatever had been stolen off of it by the time it got back to Spain on the treasure ships that the, uh, that the Spanish brought from, from the New World. So really to, to understand exactly why the, this coinage came about at the time that it did, we have to step back uh, about 32 years to the year 1700 to a, a, very, a, a very radical change that occurred in, in, in Spain in retrospect. This was a very radical change that occurred at that time. Now, previous to the year 1700, Spain had been um, under, the, under, the, under the rulership of the Habsburg uh, dynasty, the Habsburg family, which was an, an Austrian-based uh, royal house. And during, during these years under the Habsburgs, Spain had really not, the, 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 the leaders in Spain really had not been very proactive. And in terms of um, in terms of managing both Spain and and their New World colonies, basically the colonies were allowed to uh, conduct their own business as long as they followed, in theory at least, the guidelines and the rules set by the uh, the, the king in Spain. But they often didn't go and actually have a look or make inspections or. And with a few, with a few notable exceptions, um, to to check whether they were really whether the new world was really complying with all of these orders, and within Spain itself, um, because of the great wealth brought by the silver from the new world on a constant basis, on a yearly basis, uh, Spain had grown very dependent on this money, and you could call it, uh, in in modern terminology, we might call that a resource curse. It inhibited the development of any sort of manufacturing that, uh, that Spain could conduct on its own soil. And it also demotivated the nobles who lived in the countryside on their big estates from actually operating or producing anything on their estates. Uh, because what they found is that in order to really be able to be recognized by the king, they, they really needed to be close to the royal court. Um, so that they could be recognized, receive lofty titles, and, and join the uh, powerful regional councils to make rules, uh, which they couldn't do from their, from their estates. So in a sense, Spain was quite hobbled uh, by the late 1600s with this sort of rule. And some of the Western European powers recognized this. England recognized it, and, and in particular, uh, France recognized that Spain was actually not developing as, as it should at this point in history. Now, Charles II himself, uh, shown on the left here, was a very, uh, he was not very healthy during his life. Um, he was married twice, he never produced an heir to the throne. And as he grew older and, and sicker, um, there was a lot of concern about who would succeed him on the throne. And of course, the Habsburg family had, had a, uh, a claimant to the throne, but Charles was very hesitant to, uh, to go ahead and allow the Habsburg family to keep ruling because he recognized that if that were to happen, Spain's uh, European and New World possessions might not be able to remain intact. He was very concerned about the geographical integrity of Spain after his death. And in a sense, a bit ironically, the, 
the best solution that he came to was that Spain should be ruled by someone from the House of Bourbon in France who could guarantee this uh, geographical integrity. So he wrote into his will that the, the throne should go to um, Philip of Anjou of the House of Bourbon in France, who was a grandson of the then current King of France, Louis XIV. And um, so in 1700, Charles II died and Philip was uh, compelled to take the throne. Now, Philip himself was, I believe, about 17 years old. He was not, he was kind of a, a, a depressed and melancholy youth. He had no ambition and no interest in being king. Uh, he was very unhappy uh, to have been um, to have been nominated to rule the, the to to rule Spain, and he did not speak any Spanish. So, despite these shortcomings, uh, he he was compelled to take the job, and he duly moved to Spain, took the took the crown, and began to rule. Now, of course. The real ambition behind it wasn't Philip himself, but rather his grandfather, the King of France, who saw this as an opportunity to put, push through a number of uh, what he felt were critical reforms uh, to bring about the, the modernization of, of Spain. Now, one of the problems with this transfer of power, and it, it, it ended up being a, a really big deal, was that in theory, uh, Philip V, now Philip of Anjou, now crowned Philip V of Spain, had a theoretical claim to the French throne. And the Habsburgs were very unhappy with this because if, uh, if it were to come about that he became the king of both Spain and France, that would definitely and irrevocably upset the balance of power in Europe. And I show at the bottom a couple of the old cops that were being struck in, in Mexico City at this time period. The first one, of course, four reals under Charles II, and then an eight real under Philip I during the first 10 years or 15 years of his rule. Now, meanwhile, in the colonies, um, of course, uh, France also, or sorry, France, the French king had, a, had some strong ideas about how he wanted to change the way that the colonial affairs were run, uh, that would be different than what was being done under the Habsburgs. And I would say in, in the colonies at the time, the, the, governing, the governing quote of the time period would have been something like, se guarden la orden, pero son no se cumple. In other words, respect the royal orders and pay homage to the, the king off far away, off in far away Spain. Uh, but don't bother to comply with these orders if you don't agree with them. This was the governing principle there. And the, everyone more or less knew this was the case. So Philip V takes the throne on November 1st, 1700. Um, this not surprisingly immediately precipitates an armed conflict with the uh, Habsburgs. This turned into uh, a 12-year war that was uh, what was called the War of Spanish Succession. And unfortunately, this war obviously distracted Philip from uh, enacting any of these reforms right away. Um, this war was fought both in some of uh, Spain's other European possessions and then ended up being fought in Spain itself. Of course, the, the Spain had to raise an army, and the French army came in, and uh, it was quite a quite a difficult conflict during this time period. By the end of it, I suppose the irony of this conflict was that the the very thing that Charles II had wanted, which was geographical integrity of the empire, was lost. Uh, Spain and France were unable to retain. Um, a lot of the European possessions of Spain, and they ended up, by the end of the war and the, and the Treaty of Utrecht in 1814, they had essentially lost, uh, they had lost, lost a great deal, including uh, the picture below which reenacts the Battle of, 
of the Rock of Gibraltar, which they lost to the English very early on in the conflict. Now, as a result of this war, the one thing that did come out of it, which helped to, to cease the, the, the difficulties was that finally, Philip was compelled to renounce any claim to the French throne, such as he could only be king of Spain and he could not, in theory, also be king of France. Now, regardless of the war, there actually was some reform activity that went on. During, uh, as I mentioned before, the Habsburg king previously, the, the, the kings under the Habsburgs uh, had, had basically been a rubber stamp uh, for the powerful regional councils in, in Spain. And these councils didn't necessarily come up with rules or guidelines that were in the interest in Spain as a whole, but they were always looking for their own uh, self-interested uh, motives. So during the war, Spain, or rather Philip V, and of course his, his French advisors, he needed French advisors because he couldn't actually speak to his Spanish advisors, um, began to sprinkle his more reformist minded um, picks into these regional councils. And he began to write into law stipulations that would allow the king to have a lot more say in what was going on. He wanted to become a much more proactive ruler than what they had seen under, under uh, Charles II. And this led to, in 1713, the creation of the Nueva Planta, or the New Plan, which was basically two parts. It had a political part, which was what I just was saying, uh, to allow the king to become more directly involved and for the regional councils to be de-emphasized and, uh, and stick more to things that were um, applicable to Spain as a whole. And then uh, the other part was economic. Spain had to begin to develop a manufacturing sector, particularly with respect to building uh, ships. Previous to this, Spain had basically allowed their ships to be built by other powers, and then obvious, there can be some obvious problems with this um, in, in times of war. So the Nueva Planta was meant to address these issues. Now, one of the rising stars during this time was a man named Jose Patino. And I mention him because he figures very heavily into a lot of the a lot of the decisions that would lead up to the modernization of the Mexico City Mint and the coinage that we that we're going to discuss. Jose Patino is actually an Italian, but he was very he was he was very interested in the House of Bourbon and he was very enthusiastic about the reforms that they wished to enact in Spain. So he became noticed uh, by Philip V as being a very in, uncorrupted and, and, uh, and genuinely uh, enthusiastic individual. And he rose through the ranks very quickly. And by 1717, he became the chief of the Spanish Navy, which was very important from a, um, from a treasure standpoint, because now he was in charge of the flotillas that would bring the silver from the New World. And just very quickly, this has really nothing to do with the coinage we're going to talk about, but um, I mentioned before that Philip V was not very ambitious ruler. He became a bit more interested during the war of Spanish succession because of the excitement of being in, at the head of military engagements. Um, but once the war was over and, and another very short conflict after the war of Spanish succession, once those things had concluded, he uh, kind of lapsed into depression again and, and really was just waiting for his oldest son to turn 17, which he did on uh, in 1724. And he abdicated, Philip V abdicated the throne, placed his son on the throne, Louis I. Unfortunately, his son died of smallpox in seven months and Philip V was compelled to return to the throne. Now, as a result of people like Jose Patino and some of these other uh, reformist ministers, there were a number of inspections uh, that were conducted on the Mexico City Mint and a, a whole host of issues were discovered. 
um, none of these things really, from, from what I understand of the situation, none of them really described a, a, a system of widespread corruption or widespread theft of, of silver from the mint. But what they did show is that the system was extremely inefficient. Um, and not only that, but the coinage itself was not deemed reliable on the international market. The old cop simply did not conform to any international standard. So on June 9th, 1728, was the famed uh, decree of the decree of uh, mint reform for Mexico City Mint. It was actually a decree that was issued for all the colonial mints, of which there were six. Right, we're only going to talk about Mexico City here. It was the mint that was most suited to modernization uh, the, in, in the most expedient manner. Now the, the decree of mint reform had a couple parts. Uh, the larger part was that the the decree that the mint facilities themselves would have to be modernized and they would and and they rather than hammering cobs they would now bring in from Spain all of the um, more technologically modern equipment that would produce a milled um, a milled uh, screw press struck coin so they had to choose a new site for the mint um, and they brought all of the new equipment from Spain in order to do this. And this occurred during the period between 1728 and 1732. Another part of the decree of mint reform was uh, the difficulty that was obviated by the, the, the way in which mint personnel were selected. During the Habsburgs, it had been the tradition that the, this, uh, that uh, when a, say an assayer, for example, or some other supervisor at the Mint retired or died, that the office would be put up for auction and the highest bidder would, ob the highest bidder would obtain the job. It's, it, the problem with this is quite obvious uh, because, the, because these jobs went for such large amounts of money, people normally went into debt in order to obtain the job. So of course, their first priority upon being employed was repayment of that loan. In addition to this, their salaries tended not to be very high, which encouraged them basically to, um, to go about and, and to, to, uh, to embezzle the mint in order to supplement their own meager income. So another part of the, uh, the mint reform was from, from now on, the mint itself and the employees would all be directly uh, property or employees of the king, and they would receive a much higher salary, which would discourage them, which would encourage them to, to do their jobs for the king and just focus on their work. So here's an example of some of the equipment that was brought. Uh, this is just a, a general image of what a screw press looks like. And the other part of this system would have been a roll press that would create a silver sheet with a, a, a silver sheet with a very uniform thickness that would then be punched into round planchets. You can see in that little basket behind the behind this guy, and then uh, inserted into the screw press and impressed with the image. This is actually how coinage was being made already in Europe. But in the new world, this was a first. Up until this point, there had only been hammered coinage. So on March 29, 1732, the first strikes of the pillar coinage began. Now it didn't go also smooth at first. And this is because this new equipment, there was no one in Mexico, even though they brought people to give some instruction about how to operate this equipment. Uh, it was very slow at first. Thus, that in, uh, in 1732, they really had to produce two types of coins. The coin at the bottom, of course, is the, is the type that we're interested in. This is the mill type. Unfortunately, uh, they were unable to, to uh, strike them very quickly. And as a consequence, the year 1732 is the most difficult year 
it's the rarest year in all of the silver denominations. Now, other than the mill type at the bottom, they struck a lot of the top type in the red box, which is the cob type, which is the type they had been striking in the, in the 150 plus years previous to this. So that was the majority of the coinage. And they had to do both because they had a certain silver quota. They had to keep producing coins regardless. So in order to make up for the lost volume of coinage from the mill type, they struck a lot of the cop type. By 1733, they were able to get away from, uh, from hammering the old cobs and two other types of coins came into play. So the intermediate type one in the top red box was basically, it was a coin that was, that was generated by cutting uh, off a piece of silver in much the way that the old cob types were from a silver bar. But rather than being hammered, it was struck with the screw press. And you can see that there's a fair bit better detail that comes through when they apply this greater amount of pressure to the coin. And the second type below that is what's commonly called now a clippy or cut coinage type. And this, um, and this type was actually cut out of a rolled silver sheet. So in the same way that the mill coins were being, uh, were being generated, except that it wasn't punched into a round planchet, it was simply cut uh, on the edges until it was the correct weight, and then it was struck with the screw press. And as you can see, the, the detail on that comes through very nicely, um, not all of it, simply because the coin itself was not the correct geometry. And, and you'll also notice that these two uh, intermediate types of coinage were, uh, were struck with a different obverse and reverse die than, than what was stipulated in the uh, in, in the mint reform, which was this design type at the bottom. So by 1733, there were a lot, there were actually a fair number of mill coins struck, but there were also um, a, a lesser number, but a significant fraction of the coinage was with these two intermediate types. Now by 1734, they had gotten away from the older intermediate type and they were only striking the clippy or cut coinage along with the mill type. And by this time, uh, the vast majority of the coinage produced was the appropriate uh, stipulated milled type of coin, struck with the round planchet from the rolled sheet. We've only really talked up to this point about the, uh, about the eight reals, the dollar size coins, which I show up here, but they were actually five denominations. And these five denominations were struck from 1732 up to the year 1771 with very little change in the design features. Uh, there were little tweaks here and there uh, during, during these 40 years of, of mintage. And of course, there were three different kings that were honored on the coins during this time period. But other than that, uh, they're, very con they're quite consistent. And they were all struck with the consistent fineness of a 0.916 repeating fine silver. And this was, actually, uh, uh, this was actually a slight debasement on the cop coinage, which was 0.93. And of course, at, in 1970, sorry, sorry, 1771, when the design was changed away from this type, uh, the fineness was again reduced. But during the 40 years of this coinage, the fineness was remain consistent. Down in the corner I show the security edge of the coin. This is a very critical point because one of the complaints about the old cob coinage was that um, because of the angular edges, because of the sort of the random angularity of the edges, it's very easy for someone to shave off very small bits of silver um, and de facto uh, defrauding the next person who would hold the coin. And the security edge was installed on these in so that there would be no way for anyone to remove material from the edges of the coin without it immediately being obvious. And this security edge was actually applied prior to the uh, striking of the coin. And it actually, the, the edging device 
that was used um, was impressed this this design uh, strongly enough that it actually made a bit of an upturn rim, giving you a, a, a technically a type two planchet that helped seat it on the screw press. As I mentioned, this coinage spans the reign of three kings. The first, of course, is the man we've been talking about, Philip V, on, on this older 1744 real. When he passed away in 1746. One of his sons, obviously not his oldest son who had already died, but one of his younger sons, Ferdinand the Sixth, Ferdinand the Sixth took over. He ruled until 1759. And upon his death, another son of Philip's by the name of Charles the Third took the throne. And he ruled from 1759, actually until 1789, although he only retained this design type, the pillar design type, up until 1771, at which point they changed to the, uh, to the portrait or the bust type veils. One of the knock-on effects of producing this coinage was a, changing, uh, a change in the way that the Chinese received Spanish silver. Of course, the Chinese had been uh, trading to obtain silver from the New World for many years prior to this, but they had um, the way in which it was done was that they paid for bags of cobs uh, by aggregate weight rather than by by the coins themselves, because the Chinese knew very well that a lot of these old cobs were undervalued. However, after a couple after a, a couple decades of um, of this type of coinage began showing up in the Asian market in, in Manila, uh, the Chinese learned that these coins were actually quite reliable. That rather than having to melt them down into ingots or sices for use in China, they could simply just mark them um, as good and allow them to circulate as is in China, which saved them a lot of time and effort. So you ended up what became uh, Shroff or chop marks on the milled pillar coinage, as it mostly a reals because those are by far the the most traded denomination of this coin. And of course, this tradition of um, just uh, placing these these small chop marks on the coin would continue uh, and uh, prolifically through uh, later parts of the colonial history with the bust type coinage, and then even with the later independent. Um, silver coins, silver dollar sized coins coming from the independent states of, of Central and South America and Mexico. I haven't really talked about um, the work that I've done specifically on this coinage, and I'm not going to show abundance graphs and so forth. Those are all in my books and they, they go well beyond an introduction uh, that I wanted to give today, but I did want to just mention that um, this that uh, that I've collected all the pictures I can of specifically of the minor denominations, the half through the four reals, and I've die matched them all for this series. And I currently have about 6,400 coins die matched in that. And I, I did this because I was interested in what the actual abundances were. We don't know what the mintage of these coins. Um, so we don't have a really good idea other than other than by what a collector would find at a, a coin show. We don't really have a good idea of really how rare some of these are. And I particularly wanted to die match them for the sake of finding out which varieties were rare and which varieties had multiple die pairs and which only had one. And that was the emphasis of my, my long uh, study of, of this coinage. For the eight reals, I didn't die match everything. I only die match the scarcer types because as it turns out, there are so many more eight reals than any, any other denomination on the market that uh, it's a logistically impossible job for me to do that. So I just die match the, the more scarcer types that I thought were interesting. And I still came to around 4,500 coins in total for just the eight real denomination. Now you can see, I've split the varieties into 
overdates and other, other being any other type of design change on the coin. Um, and as you can see, there's actually a, it's quite a significant number of overdates. They in fact constitute about half of the known varieties of, of any of these coins. I'm not gonna read through this list. Uh, I just wanted everyone to be aware that there are many things we call varieties on the coins and they are, they're, they're major design changes that are visible on basically any grade coin. Um, my idea with this was to make it easy for a collector of even a, a finer, very good coin to be able to see what variety they had. And um, I didn't make any of these design of these varieties up. These are all works of previous researchers. And my task was to find ones that they hadn't of these types um, and to and to either validate or refute what was previously published, but couldn't necessarily be demonstrated with photographic proof. So because overdates are so fun and uh, collectors of US coins, of course, are really excited about overdates. They're a lot more abundant in the Spanish colonial coinage, of course. And I wanted to show four types of overdates here because they're kind of, it's curious how, how these different types develop. Up in the left-hand corner, we have a 1748 over seven half real, which is actually a fairly common overdate, but it's also very bold and, and, and nice. You can see the entire seven under the eight. On the top right, there is a 1740 over a 30, and this requires some explanation. My thinking on this one is that prior to 1740, they had prepared a number of working dies sometime in the 1730s, let's say 1738. And they decided that rather than place the entire date of 1738 on the coin, they would just place a one seven and a three, just in case they could, they ended up using that die in 1739. Now this die would have been left on the shelf, not used during any of those years. And eventually it would be used in 1740, but of course by that time, they would have to replace that three with a four. So they did so, which is why the four is over a three. And as you notice, the, the zero is punched over what appears to be an empty space. And this would have been because that empty space existed on the working die. 1740. All they had to do was replace this number and place this number here. And actually there is a 1741 over 31, which I believe is the same, which is the same thing. Down on the bottom left, we have a 17, we have a two over date. We have an over date of both the decade and the year digit, 1750 over 49. And then we have the curious case in the bottom right of a 17, 69 that appears to have been struck or rather modified from a 1770. And the only explanation for this would have been that in late 1769, they had pre-prepared some working dies for the, for the next year, but they turned around and had to reuse them because they ran out of working dies in 1769. There are other over things in the series which are, are curious and actually this the research I did actually um, found a, a, a number of new of new types and the uh, the point on the left and in the middle are over kings this is a, a case where a working die was modified for use um, under the succeeding king and in in uh, coin on the left is a one real from 1748 which has a FRD punched over a PHS. In other words, Ferdinand VI punched over a Philip V. And that's the, the three letter abbreviation for the minor denominations of those two kings. And in the middle, a beautiful example of a uh, Charles III over a Ferdinand VI. You can almost see every letter 
of the previous king's name under there. It's usually not the case. They're usually a lot harder to see than that. But that's a, that's a really nice example of that. And on the right, uh, we have a different type of, of over thing, which is an over assayer. Now, I mentioned before, I, on the first coin I showed was the assayer F in 1732. That assayer F carried on through the first part of 1733. But in 1733, he was given um, a backup assayer, basically, a person with the same qualifications as the chief assayer. And thus, they had to place both of their initials on the coins. So we had both M and F rather than F. And in this case, a die that had been um, created for use under with just the F assayer was modified by punching an MF over the previous F. And there would have been a floret, a five petal floret under the original F, which is now partially obscured by the new F. A few misspellings. These are pretty rare, um, probably because they are clearly mistakes and they were noticed probably very shortly after they happened. And uh, the only coins that that we see of these are the ones that managed to escape from the mint before they noticed what was happening. The one on the right and the one on the left is a two reals from 1745. And that rather than HIP, it should say HISP. They just, someone uh, mistakenly left out the S. And the coin on the right is an eight reals from 1746 under Philip, uh, from the last year of Philip V. And in this case, they spelled, you, you, you track you wrong, they put a U rather than an A. And this coin is extremely rare, um, which tells me that they probably caught that one right away and only a few got out of the mint before they retired that die. Another, uh, some other curious coins here are um, the case of the 1736 half real with an F assayer. And I just spoke about the F and MF assayers and how in 1733, they went from using just the F assayer to both uh, the M and F initials. This 1736 clearly was done at a time period when the assayers were M and F on the coin. So the only, probably the most logical explanation for this was that they ran out of obverse dyes sometime during the year and they really had to get some Coin struck. So they pulled an old uh, die off the uh, old working die off the shelf that happened to be from 1733 that had only the F. And they quickly produced some coins with this before, uh, before they had time to engrave a new working die. And I've only seen, I believe actually I've seen more than three examples of this. But they are, as you would expect, they're all the same die pair. I'm sure that this was a very short run of coins. That, uh, that was just done for some kind of quota emergency. This is another very curious coin, a 1750 two reals with the name of Philip V. Philip V died in 1746. So 1750 was fully three years within the, the reign of, of his successor, Ferdinand VI. So, probably very similar case to the previous coin. They didn't have enough obverse working dies for the two reals and they needed to quickly make some coins. So they dragged an old die off the shelf, used it for a short time period and then retired it once they had a new, a new one engraved. And I have seen seven examples. I'm surprisingly seen seven examples of this coin. And they are, as you would expect, they're all the same die pair, I'm sure. They did as few as they possibly could of this since it was technically illegal for them to be producing that coin. And this is a, a different type of problem that developed and this was by no fault of the mint. This is a different mint mark. As I've said before, 99.8% um, of the time Mexico used the M with the O above it as a mint mark. During a very short period in 1733, they used an M with an X after it. And this was done 
because of an error in a royal order given in Spain. Um, the person writing the order in Spain apparently was not familiar with the typical M with M O mint mark on the, on the coins of Mexico City, and they actually stipulated that the coin would have a mint mark of the M with the X, assuming that that's they they assume that that's how um, Mexico was in fact doing it. And when Mexico received this order, they were quite they had quite a quandary of to what to do about that because they knew that that was incorrect and yet that was the royal order and they didn't want to uh, contramand it. So they did actually produce uh, for a short term for a time period, these MX and they appear in all, all five denominations, the silver denominations of the, of the reals. Uh, but shortly after this, um, shortly after this, they, they went back to using the, their, the correct M with the O above the mint mark. And of this type, and for the eight rails at least, I've seen only seen eight examples um, with three date side dies being used. So that concludes the talk. Why do you collect these coins? Why should we collect them? Um, because they are quite a unique series. They're extremely important. They, they show a transition between sort of the old traditionalist um, political and economic stance of, of Spain, um, along with the new reformist uh, Bourbon reforms that were brought along during from the House of Bourbon in the 1700s. So they, they, they're very symbolic in, in sort of a, a, a change in Spain, an attempt to modernize. They have, uh, they, these, these five denominations cover 40 years. Um, there are plenty of common ones. There are plenty of rare ones. And there are hundreds of varieties and there are always new ones being found. Uh, I find every couple of months or so I, I see a new type. Uh, so there's plenty more to be discovered about this series. And lastly, uh, these have a very aesthetic design. They're simply really balanced, um, balanced and beautiful coins to look at. So they, they can have that attraction. And with that, um, my talk is finished. I can, I suppose I can take some questions now. Sorry, I think I was muted. Um, thanks a lot, Brad. That was great. We do have a few questions. Um, first one is, uh, are any blank planchets known with the security edge? I think I've heard about some, but I've never seen them. So I, I couldn't, personally, I can't, um, I can't verify that, that any exist. Okay. Uh, second question, uh, what uh, can you tell us about any contemporary counterfeits of uh, eight reals pieces? Um, of just the eight reals or of any of the pillar coins? Uh, they were asking specifically about the eight reals. There are, but, um, there are a few contemporary counterfeits. Curiously, um, because I've also studied the, the portrait types, which came uh, after 1771, and those, with those, there, there, are, there are hundreds of types of contemporary counterfeits. But curiously, with the pillar type, there are very few. I personally only have uh, a few examples cataloged of that. And there are, of course, uh, other denominations, uh, pillars that have contemporary counterfeits, but these also are, are quite rare. All right, uh, next question. Uh, how to determine uh, fake pillar dollars and what years are the most uh, counterfeited? Well, um, I've seen fakes of pretty much every uh, date and every denomination uh, of these coins. So I, there are some dates that I do see more than others, but it depends on the denomination. I mean, there's, there, I, I, I would say the, the most abundantly uh, counterfeited or rather faked coins are, the, are some of the rarer ones. For example, the, the four reals of almost any date are 
there's a lot of fakes, specifically because the four reals are rarer as a denomination. And so that's a more lucrative market for, for uh, fakes. But the eight reals, I would say, you know, you have to look out for the rarer dates. For example, the 1732 and 33 are, are, are highly faked. Uh, but pretty much any date, even if it's a even if it's a dirt common date, uh, there's there's a there's there are fakes floating around. All right. Uh, next question: uh, Which is more collectible, the shield type or the portrait type? Well, that, that I'm rather biased because, of course, I I, I really like the port or sorry the the uh, the pillar type. If you're starting out and you don't want to spend a lot of money, you're better off starting with the portrait type because those, tend, those are more, um, they're, they're more abundant and it's easier to get a, a, good, uh, a good start on a collection for, for less money. The pillars tend to be a bit more expensive. Okay, uh, next question. Um, are these widely counterfeited and uh, what are some typical signs of uh, baked coins? Yes, they are. They are very uh, highly counter or counterfeited, or I would say faked, because we're talking about modern counterfeits. I assume, um, and one of the things would be the weight of the coin. These were uh, these were struck with very specific um, weight specifications. So if they fall well outside of those weight specifications, ob obviously on the lower end, then that that is your first sign. That the coin is that the coin is bad. Um, another sign would be the security edge. It's some of the older, more poorly made fakes do not have the correct security edge, or they have no security edge at all. Um, the newer ones, unfortunately, some of them have pretty good security edges, so that doesn't always help you. And other than that, it's it's like the fakes of of any other coin in that you just have to really look at a lot of them. If, uh, if you're spending time on eBay and you're looking for them there, I would caution you that um, eBay photos are, are often not good enough to really be able to tell whether the coin is good or not, uh, even if you've looked at a lot of them. But I would say you just, you just have to have your eye adjusted to the very specific little design details, the shape of the letters, um, the shape of these different, especially the shape of the mint mark. Is, is, is often a good, uh, a good way to um, authenticate the coin. But to really do that, you just, you just have to spend a lot of time looking at real ones. And uh, next question is about collectability, how collectors approach the series. Um, are they collecting by date or variety? And what are typical price ranges for these coins? Okay, well, the, curiously, even though the eight reals is the most abundant by far in terms of in terms of mintage and, and uh, availability on the market. They are also the most expensive because they, the mo but many more people are collecting the eight reals than the, than the minor denominations. Um, if you want to get a nice, uh, if you want to get a nice eight real, say a, 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 an XF or an AU eight real, you're, you're going to be looking at, at you know, $400 plus for, for a nice coin. And most of the eight real dates are fairly abundant, with the exception of say 1732 and, and 33. So you're sort of kind of even across the board in terms of what you would pay for those. Um, I and the eight reals are relatively easy to collect by date. That's how you would like to collect them. If you're looking at the miners. The half real is fairly easy to collect by date, except for the 1732, that's the key date. Some of the other denominations, it'll take a while. Uh, 40 years of coins um, will take a while for say a one and a two real, that's relatively difficult. And the four reals are very difficult. That would be the big challenge to, to collect a, a date run of, of, of the four reals. Now, um, if if you're getting into the varieties, that that's where it's kind of it's it's up to you. What do you what do you consider an important variety? If you're looking at overdates, there's so many um, that would be quite a challenge. But you could certainly 
find a lot. Uh, a lot of the coins you end up just getting, uh, the first one you'll get might, might end up being an overdate because of the abundance of, of overdates. Right. Um, next question is, uh, do we see examples with clash marks from the opposite die? Yes, they're relatively uncommon, but yes, you do get that. Okay. All right, uh, next question. Uh, do we have any idea how much of the Spanish dollars ended up uh, circulating in the English colonies or in the West Indies? Oh, well, yes, they, 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 got, they went through the West, West Indies quite a bit. And this is, this is documented partly because of all of the ways in which the, um, the Caribbean countries or the, the Caribbean islands um, cut them and otherwise modified them for use. Uh, we see little bits of, of pillar coinage showing up in in, uh, in segments of coins that were used in different in different countries in the in different places in the Caribbean. So yes, they were they were definitely used a lot there, and we see that. Uh, as far as Europe is concerned, um, I think the vast majority of the coins that were, for example, sent to Spain were immediately given to creditors or used to pay for manufactured products from other countries and they, those were all melted down. Um, so, and then of course we have a whole bunch of coins that went off to, uh, to China of which obviously we've still got a lot of because we have plenty of, of uh, chop mark coins from both this series and then the, the succeeding uh, colonial series. So yeah, they did get around, but I think in, in, if we're just talking about Europe, most of those were melted. Uh, we have a very interesting question here. Uh, asks if the over mintage of eight reals and under mintage of four reals impacted the early US coinage, uh, which uh, for the early US coinage, you had a lot more half dollars than, than silver dollars. Huh. That is an interesting question and I don't, I don't, uh, I don't know enough about early U.S. coinage to know what the, how the decision, what decisions were made in terms of proportion. All I can say is that for Spanish, for the Spanish coins, the, the obvious emphasis was on uh, producing as many eight reals as possible. In fact, probably based by some counts, 85% plus of the, of the mintage went into eight reals. And this was primarily because of the the king required either a, a, depending on the year, required either a fifth or a tenth of all mintage to be sent directly back to Spain as sort of a, a payment to the king. So that was the reason for that. Uh, how that how that interacts with what early U.S. coinage was doing, I, I don't I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, how much of the mass was lost with where, for example. Uh, half reales in the United States uh, often circulated at five cents instead of uh, six and a quarter cents. Can, can you say that again? Yeah, the question is how much of the, the coin mass was lost with circulation oh. where? So for example, in the US, we see these half reals uh, circulating yes. with the value of five cents. Yeah, that, that's correct. Um, yeah, I, it was, I think it was just really convenient that five, that placing them at a value of five cents because that obviously synced with uh, a five cents in the US. But yes, uh, I, I know studies have been done and unfortunately I don't have those figures off hand as to create, for example, a, a, a typical very good coin loses X percent of its mass. Um, I do know that I did, and I didn't include it in this talk because uh, I didn't want to run over, I did weights. I, I, I weighed everything that I could uh, for all the different denominations. My conclusion was that if I included weights for coins under the grade of very fine, I began to have some problem with consistency in the weight. In other words, coins that were fine and down uh, lost sufficient mass that they were consistently under the minimum uh, required weight that the Spanish would have struck, that, that the mint would have struck them at. All right, uh, next question is, um, how do these coins come today? Do you see more high-grade examples or more lower and mid-grade examples? Well, there's, there's plenty of low-grade examples, uh, particularly the minor coinage was, was used extensively in Mexico. 
So you, you, get, you get all grades. Um, but curiously, you do get some uncirculated coins. And uh, it's, it's amazing how the prices um, accelerate quickly when you get up to about MS62. You, you, really, uh, you, you really start to get expensive in, in terms of what, what price you'll pay for those. Um, but you'll, you'll, there, there are all grades available. All right, uh, next question is, uh, are there any portrait reals with pillars? Well, you could say that the, the portrait reals are also pillar reals because on the reverse side of the coin, the non-portrait side, there are again, the two uh, pillars of Hercules on either side of the, uh, the coat of arms. So those, those are technically also pillars. I, I don't know if that was the, was the point of the question though. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I answered it. Um, another question, uh, did, um, did these coins uh, circulate in Europe? And I, I think you suggested that they, they did, but then they were melted. Yeah, I, I'd say they didn't really circulate. Uh, the later portrait types were, of course, countermarked in, 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 in England, in Scotland, um, and in Scotland. But the, the pillar types, I, yeah, I, there are a few countermarked pillars. That, that I've seen in Europe, but generally, uh, like I was saying before, the vast majority were just sold, were used to pay for stuff, and then they were melted down and, and, and rendered into other uh, European coin types. All right, and then uh, last question. Uh, if someone's interested in your books, where could they acquire them? Oh, okay. Um, well, I don't know how to do this, but uh, they can always just write me an email. Um, I don't know exactly how to give you that email here. Can I just say it? Um, you could, or uh, if if, uh, if someone wants to write into the uh, Newman Portal via our front page, uh, newmanportal.org, uh, we will get you connected with um, with Brad. Okay. Yeah, I don't don't really. I, I thought that my question might come. Out. I wasn't really prepared how yeah, I would. No problem. I would let you know, but just writing an email is the easiest way. Sure. All right, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, thank you very much, Brad. It's a fascinating talk. And uh, we have continued programs today. Check our schedule. And uh, thanks for attending.